Please open with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. That is where we will find ourselves uh, this morning. The Bible has a lot of uh, pictures and analogies, imageries and uh, shadows or ways to explain what it is that you are currently involved in right now that is the local church. It has a lot of different ways of explaining it. Uh, The book of 1 Timothy is all about the local church. That's what we've been doing as we sort of walk through uh, a bit by bit through the uh, book. We are learning about who should lead the local church, what should be taught at the local church, how should we conduct ourselves in the local church, and it's not primarily talking about the universal church. It's not primarily in 1 Timothy talking about uh, the global body of believers from all uh, ages and all nations, that's, that's not practical enough. Everybody by faith and by joining God's family is a member of that global church, but we are all also commanded to find ourselves within local manifestations and local gatherings of churches. That is very much, that is precisely, that is exactly what the word church means. It means a gathering of people called. So uh, the local church has been our theme throughout First Timothy, and it will continue to be so. But in the New Testament, as well as if, you, as, as if you look at Old Testament prophecies, which foresaw the church and what Christ would do in the church, uh, there's a lot of different imageries and ways of explaining or imaging the church. One of them is uh, a bride and a groom. That is that Jesus Christ is the man who came to us as a damsel. While we were in sin under Satan and under the law, uh, Jesus came down. He fought Satan. He fought sin. He overcame the grave as a a shining knight. And he uh, uh, sliced the enemies with his sword. He rescued us. He took us home to his kingdom. And we are now bride to Jesus Christ. He is the groom. And all of his money becomes our money. Yes, all of, our, all of his blessings and inheritance become ours because we have joined our states with him in spiritual marriage. Another picture that the Bible has is one of like a branch or, or, a, or a vine with little branches coming off of it. And Jesus says, I'm the branch. And those who believe in me are, uh, I'm the vine, sorry. And those who believe in me are branches. That is that we are joined to Jesus Christ. We get our life from Jesus Christ. We grow our fruit by the, by the merits and the help that we get from Jesus Christ. There's lots of other pictures. Uh, one of them is kingdom, which we touched on before. Jesus is a king. He's rescued us and brought us under his rule and reign. The one that we're looking at today is the imagery of of household or family. So here's the big idea for today. The church is a family. The church is God's family. This is reflecting chapter 3, uh, where, where, which we read multiple weeks ago, when God says that the local church is the church of the living God, the household of God. That is that we are a family. God, we are taught by Jesus to pray to God as our Father. We relate to Jesus Christ as our older brother who earns an inheritance for us. Hebrews tells us that when Jesus presents himself to God, he is not ashamed of calling you or I his brothers and sisters. Can you imagine that? Anybody have older siblings that have very often in your life refused and been ashamed to call you their brother or sister? If you're an old younger sibling, you may say, no, never frequently behind your back. I assure you, they did this. Him, I don't know who he is. Let's sell him or kill him or run away from him quickly before he he, uh, shows that he's a blood relative of mine. Embarrassment often marks brothers and sisters. That's just how it is. Well, if anybody has a right or a reason to be embarrassed of his brothers and sisters, tell you what, it's Jesus. But before God, he willingly, he voluntarily, he graciously takes sinners by the hand, leads us to his father, says, these are my brothers and sisters, washed in my blood, saved from their sins because I died for them. That's our, that's our older brother, Jesus. We are also given the spirit of adoption. That is to say that when the spirit uh, uh, comes to us and gives us life, he makes us new children. First, Tim, first uh, sorry, John chapter 1 calls this being born of God. Not something you did, not something you accomplished, not something a guru said over you or sprinkled you with magic water. God himself made you born again. That's why you believe in Jesus. But then he says, because because you've been born again, and because you believe in Jesus, God gives you a legal right, a divine contract that calls you an adopted son of God. That is that all women, children, all women, children, men, old, young, anybody who believes in Jesus are legally sons of God. That is, we receive his inheritance and we are adopted into his family. We call God our father. 
And then when you come into, uh, say, reading the Gospels, Jesus says, uh, as, as his brothers and Mary come to get him because he's an embarrassment to the family, Jesus says to the crowd around him, oh, my mom wants me. Does she want me to stop preaching? Uh, uh, my brother and sisters want me to shut up. I'll tell you, who are my mother, my mothers, my brothers, and my sisters? My mothers, my brothers, my sisters are those who do the will of God. That is therefore the fact that everybody who has done the will of God by believing on His Son, everybody who lives their life by the Spirit and obeys the Bible, they are those, that they live that way because they are the, the brothers, the sisters, the family members of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is in our midst this morning, as He is every time we gather to worship, and we're about to read His rules for this household. It's God our Father's household. Jesus, the eldest son, is put in charge of this household. He is building the household. He rules this household. And we as a family are about to read some household rules for how we need to treat each other, look after each other, and who we should support financially. That's our goal this morning. Which means that if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, if you've been invited here, praise God that you're here. We're really glad you're here. If you are a person who maybe you come along with the family because you're too young to be allowed to say no, uh, maybe whether you're here according to your will or against your will. If you are here and you know you don't have faith in Jesus and you're not going to heaven, maybe you don't even believe in those things, what you're about to hear this morning, this is basically you. You have been invited over to our place for dinner and you are sitting down as we have a family meeting. And we say, here's our values, let's remember our goals, let's set some uh, 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 assignments for each other, let's make sure that this family is getting along. Now, you are a guest and we're glad you're here. But at this point, I don't know if you, maybe, maybe you're, you're like as white as white comes, and you've got like six generations of, of anglo saxon that's me, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that, I'm, I'm as Australian, pretty far back, and then it's like English and Scottish and that's and no French, so I'm I'm a happy man. I'm very you know, I, and I love my heritage. But I have that means that when I I have lots of friends in Australia who have very different backgrounds to me. And if I ever went over their house, Greek, right? I have Greek cousins. Um, or on this side, I go to like an islander's friend's house, and or, or I go to, over to a a a, 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 a a Slavic friend. I had a Slavic friend. I went to their birthday party, and I'm asking all these questions. I'm like at their gatherings. Like, Where's the furniture? Why are we sitting on the ground? That's for walking? I don't understand. Where is uh, the, 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 the vegetables? There is nothing but meat. I like this, this, uh, this culture. This is my new favorite culture. I'm going to be adopted into this island of culture. Or there's the, and they're wearing certain clothes. I'm like, why didn't I get a floral elite necklace? What are we doing? When you come into a, a family gathering with family values and rules of a different culture of yours, you're sort of shocked. You go, wow, this is different to me. And I hope that that's your um, impression this morning as we go through Christian, Jesus, household rules for the church. I hope that if you're not a believer, you, you hear these things, and maybe some are offensive. You're like, hey, we, we don't eat that. This is different to my family. This is, you're saying things are sin that I love. You just called my lifestyle devilish and satanic. That's not nice. Well, that's because this isn't your family. There's a really big difference between you and us. And what we hope God would do in your heart is that as you sit here, you would go, wow, this is so different to my values, to my identity. This is so different to me. I want to be a part of this family. I hope that God breaks your heart and you realize, I'm outside of this family, morally speaking. I break God's laws. I'm not, I'm not right to be a part of God's family. I, I'm a sinner. I, I'm guilty. I don't look like God's children because I'm not one of his children. I look like my father, which Jesus says, is the devil, if you don't believe in Jesus. Everyone looks like their father eventually, and you'll either look like God the father or look like the devil, depending on who you have faith in. And so I hope that this morning your heart is broken. You say, wow, I, I thought I was religious. I, I, I didn't want religion wherever you're at. I hope that you look at the family rules and say, I want forgiveness in Jesus, and I want to be a part of this family, and I want to be a part of this church. That's my prayer for you. So let's read the household rules that Paul applies to the church. 1 Timothy 5, verse 1, we're going through to verse 16. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger, brothers, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has her hope set on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day, but she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well. 
so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband or a one-man woman, a one man woman, a faithful woman, and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who truly are widows. May God bless this word to us and for his glory in our midst. One of my first ever sermons that I ever preached back as a late teenager, I was invited to a church that were going through 1 Timothy and I was given the passage on widows. Great, thank you. Well, that's an honor. I would love as a young man to preach on, on widows. And then I read the text and I figured out why the pastor didn't want to preach it because it's 90% gone, here's what women do wrong. And I had to take the brunt of that. This is one of those passages that make a lot of modern day commentators say, Paul's a misogynist, we shouldn't read him, he's not written by the Spirit, put him away. All right? The exact kind of people Paul wrote about saying, they don't know what they're talking about, shut up. So Paul is said, uh, Paul is an apostle, and he sent Timothy to Ephesus, which is a multi multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-metropolis uh, 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 megachurch, and he sent Timothy in and gone, they're a family, they're not acting like it. They're not acting responsibly. They're, they're looking after their own interests. They're not remembering their members of God's household. Timothy, you need to go back in and establish some order. And the big point is here in verse uh, 7, when he says, you have to command and teach these things, as well as everything else I've told you, all the doctrinal stuff, you also have to command practical godliness in family matters so that the church can be free from reproach. Reproach. So that people can't look on the church and say, they mistreat each other. They're not a real family of God. So that the devil can't look on and accuse and slander and, and tell believable lies about us because of how we mistreat or treat each other in either folly or lack of discernment. So this is the big point of, of, uh, of today, that the church is a family and that must affect how we live. The first part of the uh, implication of us being a family is relational. That is the first uh, implication that we are a family comes down to how we treat one another. And Paul tells Timothy this, how to treat others. But remember, everything that Timothy does, we're told in verse uh, 12 of chapter 4, is meant to be an example for everybody else. So everything Timothy is being told about treating each other as family is also applicable to you and to every other Christian. And what he tells him is this, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him. And he starts with the old guys. Because it seems like the old guys were the problem back in chapter 4 when he was saying, don't let the angry, bitter, ageist, boomer, uh, members of the congregation start giving you a problem. Don't let them escape from God's word. Don't let them make you tone down your preaching just because they're despising you for being a young pastor. That's sin. Don't let them do it and you will be in sin if you shrink back in cowardice, Timothy. Preach it. But that doesn't mean that when you're talking to them, you treat them with disrespect that would be improper for an old man. Old men, Paul believes, not just culturally from the Greco-Roman world, but biblically from the Old Testament we see, and now it's imprinted into the New Testament, older men and women deserve respect that younger people do not uh, uh, necessarily or immediately deserve. That is that you treat people differently and age is one of those things. 
uh, an older man. He may be in sin, but don't get up and start calling him out and making old jokes, fat jokes. Uh, 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 you know, oh, this guy, you know, he called me young. Well, you know, I saw him try and kick a soccer ball last week and he broke his hip. Let's all have a good laugh at old, old geriatric uh, uh, enemy in the congregation. That's not going to be fitting of a, of a congregation that is meant to image God's family. He says, no, rebuke him in a way that's more like an encouragement. So you come up to an old man, you treat him like your father. Like, how would I talk to my father if he was doing something inconsistent? I wouldn't slam the door down, sit him down, and give him what for, because I'd wake up three weeks later in a coma, probably, or in a field half buried. I don't know. You come up to your father with a respect. You have an honor for him, and his sin is marring his honor. You want to restore the honor. You don't want to strip the honor. You want to come up to the old man and say, as far as I can see, and I may be wrong, As far as I can see, and I have limited wisdom, but as far as I can see, you're out of step with the word of God. Can you help me see why this is happening? I'm praying that you live up to the honor that your current status, role, and age would demand because I love you, because I respect you, because I honor you. Timothy needs to not return evil for evil upon, uh, you know, ageist old people are not fixed by Timothy coming in and being ageist against and dishonoring against the old men. He must encourage them as a father. He says, younger men as brothers, right? And if you, if you grew up with brothers, you wonder why Paul said that. Because brothers are violent, and that's where I get my ministry model from. Young men, <laughs> I'm allowed to punch them in the teeth because that's, that's, that's what I did to my brother. Paul said, treat him like you treated your older brother, Tom. All right, I'll do it, Lord. It's my cross to bear. I'll beat on him. I'll wail on him. That's, uh, that's how brothers... Show, if, if your brother didn't show his love to you through bruises upon the skin, you have a sister. That's how it works. <laughs> brothers are violent. Brothers are rough. But I think really what Paul's saying is, Timothy, you're an elder. You're sent from an apostle. I tell you constantly in this book, declare with all authority. But it's Christ-like authority. Don't lord it over them. They're your age. They're, they're younger men. You don't get to pop, prop yourself up and make them your slaves and lick your feet and wash your sandals. And uh, That's not the point. You don't lord it over them. They are your brothers. You're in the household of God. Exhort. Yes, you get to rebuke men more harshly who are younger, but still they are your brothers. He says, old women are like your mothers. Treat them that way. And we have people like this in our congregation, and it's a blessing of God that when uh, old people are wise and age is making them mature instead of grow bitter, when they are like a good wine instead of milk, which goes sour in old age, they are like wine which, 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 which ages beautifully and has more character to it. That is what uh, godly people are like. And Paul says, invest in those people because they are going to be investments back into you. They're godly. Treat them like a mother. Even if she's in sin, address her like a mother. Gently, considerately, lovingly. And younger sisters, uh, younger women as sisters. So, single Timothy in metropolitan megachurch. Don't meet with them alone. That would be to mar their reputation, and a brother doesn't do that to a sister. Don't pastor them according to how they rate on your zero to ten hot scale, Timothy. That would be to dishonor, to objectify women who are your sisters in the household of God. That means, more broadly speaking, for all men, you don't come to church like you're on a speed dating app or speed dating show, and you'll worship Jesus and you'll sing the songs, but primarily 99% of the reason you got out of bed today is because you're single, and so are some pretty girls here, and so that's why you're here, you're going to scope out, find somebody, grab them, Uh, uh, hopefully she's a good one, Uh, sleep with her, uh, touch her, uh, ask for photos from her, because after all, I'm a man. No, that is, first of all, spiritual incest, so have that. You're mistreating them, you're forgetting that they are your sisters, But secondly, of course, you will probably end up marrying another young woman from this congregation, from your local church. Usually, that's often how it happens. But there is a way to pursue them, treat them, and remember, they are first, gods. They are second, Jesus. They are third, the spirits. They are fourthly, this congregation's. Fifthly, they maybe might potentially be a future spouse, but I'll respect them in that order. Younger women as sisters, Timothy. Be careful. Then he gets on, so relationally, the way that uh, the family, uh, uh, because the church is a family, that will affect our relations. That is to say, against all sort of equality uh, mantras these days, you don't treat everyone the same. You don't. 
I don't treat everybody the same because some are older and demand respect. Some are older and very godly. They, they, they deserve more def- deference and, and honor. Some people are younger and you're allowed to be harsher with them because they still need to learn to put away their arrogance before they open their mouth. We don't treat everyone the same. There are things I can say to a guy that I will not say to a girl. Uh, I, I've been through, I've counseled uh, couples and marriages all the time. And very frequently, he will maybe say afterwards to the side, or he will ask right in the meeting, how can you talk to me like this and not her? Because if I punch you, you get back up and you cry. If I hit her, I go to prison, and she'll probably die. We are completely different. And it applies the same with words. Men are made stronger, more powerful, different. I hit you with words because all the responsibility is yours, and you're meant to take it. I don't treat her that way. She's gentle. She's the weaker vessel. She's a sister. I don't hit my sister. I hit my brother. I body slam my brother through mum's fine china cabinet. I, I, don't, I don't do that to my sister. So, yes, in fact, we treat people differently. And this sort of equality, tolerance, crazy world that we live in doesn't really make sense of that. Families acknowledge that there is differences in relationships and we should act accordingly. The next that we see is financial. What's one implication of being a family? We relate to each other as as such. What's another implication of being a family? Our finances. Your godliness affects your wallet and affects your budget, or you're not a Christian. That's what Paul says in verse 8. The way you live your life in your money now is different to how you spent money before you became a Christian. The fact that you belong to a church requires obligations and contributions. The fact that you are uh, listening to sermons means that somebody is on staff to prepare sermons and therefore you you have contributions to pay. Uh, The fact that uh, you have uh, poor people around you in your family, that makes an obligation upon you. The fact that you uh, have children now, uh, you don't get to keep on living your same lifestyle. For everybody in every station of life, the fact that you're a Christian affects your budget Well, Paul says, you haven't thought much about this faith you pretend to have. Christianity, godliness will affect our money and where we put our money. And we see this, first of all, in verse 3. Paul says, as a command to Timothy for the church, honor widows. That word honor means to financially support. You're going to see this again later when he says, honor elders in, in terms of paying preachers. But honoring in this context is often used for uh, financially paying. He says those who are truly widows. So the church needs to look at widows, like we just got told, as mums. You look at her as a mum. If your mum's starving because all of the, the kids and the grandkids are rushing to have dinner and they all slam food for themselves and she's left with crumbs... You have some heads to crack together, you get your mum some food. She can't rush to the table fast enough. You've got to change how you're doing family. If mum is among us, if a spiritual mother, if widows are among us, starving, struggling, can't get to church because they're infirm and, and the like, the church says, hey, Paul said to treat her like a mother. What would I do? What would I do if my mum was at that church and suffering that way? So we get in and we help even financially support. More on that when we get to verse 9. So yes, financially, we support widows because she is our spiritual mother. But also, he says, godliness in the church family also means that children need to support their biological parents. This is where a bit of a difference comes into our thinking, and we need to make a distinction on my opening claim. The church is a family. Amen. What a wonderful, amazing, glorious, biblical truth. Let me say another one, though. The church does not replace your biological nuclear family. If you go into your office and Mr. Scott, whatever your boss's name is, says, oh, uh, at this paper company, we are a family. We love each other. We're best friends. We treat each other like family. We give each other free stuff. We work for free for each other. You say, no. (laughs) No, this is not a family. This is a job. I have a contract. You pay me or I leave. That's how this works. It's not a family. That's weird. Sometimes it can happen the same way in churches. They go, we're a family. You go, amen. You go, no, I'm, your, I'm your dad. Aren't I? Kind of. You can call me padre or puppy or daddy or abba or father. And, and churches can get weird and go, we're a church. We're a family. Don't you love us? Don't leave. Lock the doors. <laughs> and, so, and so they say things like, aren't you godly? Don't go serve your family. Serve the ministry. 
Oh, you're a godly young man. That's why you should join the church. You should not get married. What a waste of time. Oh, you're so ambitious. Don't, 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 don't. Uh, you have so much money. You should donate all of that to the church and get lots of rewards and your family can starve to death. That'll make them martyrs. It'll be fine. They'll get rewards. They're okay. They say that whereas what we should see and as an, as an enormous correction to that, we should bulldoze that thinking and realize church as a family strengthens nuclear family. Church as a family empowers and solidifies nuclear family. Church as a family respects the boundaries of nuclear families, and it does not destroy or replace nuclear families. So, where there is a godly, spirit-filled, Great Commission-minded church, there will be healthy marriages. There will be men who work full-time jobs and look after their family. There will be a lot of weddings happening because marriage is held in honor among all and pursued as a gift from God. There will be lots of babies popping out everywhere because they love family and men know that this is a part of their God-given duty and responsibility to raise up offspring and the wives know that this is a blessing and part of their purpose for living is to bring you life into the world who can glorify Jesus. Where there is godliness, there will be strong families. There will be strong husbands. There will be... I was running some numbers this week. It's like if, if I have five kids and my grandkids keep on having five, you know, my kids and my grandkids, they have five kids for a couple of generations. By 70 years, which if I live to 95, very unlikely. But if I make it, uh, I'll probably be half robot by then. But if I make it to 95, I will have 185 uh, people who have the last name Ford calling me uh, 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 father, grandfather, father-in-law, something like that. If a church of 100 families or 100 people did that, then within... 90 years, we would have about 20,000 people who belong to this church with zero additional conversions, just evangelizing our babies. If we did that over 200 years, that would exponentially grow to about one and a half million people. Oh, it's the population of our city. Imagine if we had a Brisbane-sized church family who had been raised in the faith, taught God's word. Why? Because many cults throughout history say, don't get married, give your money to church. Oh, you're married to church, not to your wife. And lo and behold, they die out because they have no children. (laughs) The church is not like that. The church is the better and greater family. The church does not replace God's ordinary, wonderful, natural, nuclear family. So all of that to say When Paul starts going through household codes, he's saying, here's how to be a really spiritual child. It's not just pray for your dad. It's not just send your mom a tract in the mail. It comes down to this. When your dad dies, you are now responsible for your aging mother. She lives with you. You pay her bills. She is is now, you are looking after her the same way she looked after you when you were young. And if you refuse to do that, Paul has words for you. It means that you don't have... Uh, uh, elderly parents and say, gee, they're they're, they're a big nuisance, aren't they? They kind of affect my lifestyle and they stop me from being able to... If your mom had that mindset, she'd have got an abortion. On the other end of their life, they get to lean on you the way as a child gets to lean on their parents. And so you look after... That doesn't mean every mother-in-law is going to want to live with you, maybe. It doesn't mean that every household can actually have elderly people inside if they need all of these medical equipments. But you look after them in the same parental mindset that parents look after children. Paul says this in the context of who you should support as a widow... Timothy, who you should give money to and support as a spiritual mother and a widow in our congregation. And he says in verse 4, If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness. Oh, you mean pray and speak in tongues towards their dying relatives in a faraway city. No, pay their bills. That's what godliness looks like. Make sure they have food to eat. Buy their groceries and put it on their table. Stuff your pool room, put in a spare room so that grandma can live at home. That's godliness. See how practical that is? Real godliness. Show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Make a return. You know what that sounds like? Obligation. You know, our, our generation despises and hates owing anybody. 
Oh, I don't need my parents. They got us into this problem. They were toxic. They traumatized me. They smacked me once. Oh, now I have, I have all of these issues. And so I stuffed my family, stuffed my grandparents, I stuffed the colonizers. I, I, bla- I, I, I curse out all of the people that ever did in, in, and invented literally anything that I benefit from. And there's, there's a $1,000 phone. I'm going to complain about how hard my life is. Okay, boomer, don't listen to you. You started wars. You're just ageist. You don't understand how hard my life is. God despises that kind of thinking, and he sees as pleasing in his eyes a Christian who says, everything I have, natural and supernatural, came at somebody else's gifting and cost. I worked hard, sure, with hands that my mother grew in her belly. You have nothing that you did not in some way receive from God through other people. So in our very ageist, Marxist, generational gap, uh, generation infighting kind of age, Paul says, children, you owe your parents. You have to make a return on the investment they made in your life by looking after them in their older years. You owe it to them. And we should, Jesus actually makes this a direct application to the fifth commandment. In his day, people were saying, Yeah, the the fifth commandment says, honor your mother and father. But, well, if you say spiritually that everything you own belongs to God, then you can hold on to it, but God sees it as his, so you're just not allowed to share it. Selfishness (laughs) codified in biblical law, they thought. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, you're going to hell. You're cursed. Woe upon you. Why? Because you say, I've devoted it all to to God to the church, and when your elderly mother needs help, you say, sorry, mom, I can't help you. I need to, look, I, you know, all my money belongs to God. I'm married to the church. I'm really holy, whatever it may be. Jesus says that supporting aging parents is a direct application to honoring your mother and father. It's in the big 10. It's in the 10 commandments. So we need to think very seriously, very practically, very applicably on the ground about how we can look after the elderly in our congregation, starting with those in your own family. Paul then says, has words for the guys who no matter what Timothy says, no matter what Paul says, will find an excuse to squeeze out of this. He says, no, I'm, I don't make enough, or I'm investing for my children. Yeah, let's say that. Or I'm building a portfolio, or uh, I've got a very demanding job, or I'm some kind of excuse. Paul says in verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Because you know what pagans who mistreat their parents, you know what they don't do? They don't claim to be children of the father. You claim to be a child of the father who gave forth his son, who worked his whole life, who gave of himself in order to benefit his children and his household, spiritually speaking, And you say, I'm like him, and I'm making my own money, and I can't afford to support old Auntie Betty or old Grandma Susie who's dying. Shame on you. You're not a Christian. Paul says if there's men whose life goal is to be stay-at-home dads, you need to get converted because you're not a Christian. Guys who say, I don't want to work so much. I want to pursue my artistic painting career, and it doesn't pay well, but my wife can work, and that's fine. I could work, but no, I want to pursue my dreams. You are going to hell. You're not a Christian. When you get born again, you come into this new creation. And it's a God-like creation. We get his heart and we want to be fathers. We get his heart and we become responsible. And so we pursue responsibility and work hard. We go to work, make less money than we wish we could. 99% of guys hate their job, wish they got paid more, probably should be paid more. It's not unique. This is mankind. We go to a job that we don't love, get paid less than we should be getting paid, go home to a house we wish was bigger for a wife we wish we could spend more time with and kids we wish we could bless more and we wish we could be less angry at than we are. We go to sleep, we wake up, we go to work again. And then you retire or die in the process. You know what God calls that? Pleasing. Oh, you've got to fix up your heart. You've got to make sure you're taking joy in it. But you know what that is? To a man, life goals. To live and work and sweat and bleed for the ones that I love so that they can have a better life, so that they can be further forward. I love that idea. Every Christian man says in his heart, amen, because he's not selfish. So Paul says, look, if you make some excuse to not look after your dying mother or mother-in-law or look after your children or support your wife financially, you are worse than an unbeliever. Go to work. And then he starts talking about widows. So we've said... We need to relate to each other as family. We've also said we need to financially look after each other as family, but primarily and first, our own family, 
those in our household, not selfishly, but responsibly. And then he says, if the church is a household, you know what else she needs to be? Discriminating. Discriminating. A church that is not discriminating is as dangerous for the people in that church as if a family is non-discriminating. Big open door policy, key underneath the mat, take whichever car you want. I don't even need to know your name. You can come in, babysit the kids, leave your kids here, use our kitchen, use our toilet. Just a big, basically a big public house. If you have that, you're abusing your children. You have no clue who might come in. People don't do that. We have some sense. But some churches act that way. Fill in a form online, we'll give you money. Uh, Come along and say you love Jesus. Sure, we'll support you financially. And all the husbands who are going to work to support their family and they're carving out some money to give to the church, we're going to waste it by giving it to whoever wants it. It's undiscriminating. And in doing so, they put the church under reproach because the devil can slander them and other people can look on at the church and say, the church, uh, the orderly household of God apparently, led by Jesus Christ, she supports anybody. She's foolish with her money. She, she, she supports these people financially who are godless, who are selfish, who are worldly. That must be the sort of thing that God values. So Paul actually says, just because somebody's husband has either died or left does not mean the church is required to financially support them. He actually has a few discriminating qualifications for the types of people, types of widows that should actually be financially supported by the church. Um, He says, first of all, uh, those who are truly widows. He says that in verse 3. Honor widows who are truly widows. And he explains what he means. Those who have no family, no grandchildren to support, no daughter or son she could move back home with, no one that can look after her. Verse seven goes, uh, verse 5 and 6 goes on to say, she has no one to rely on but God alone. She's praying for her next meal to arrive because she's starving otherwise. That sort of widow. Someone who doesn't have a million dollar bank fund because her husband had a great life insurance policy. Somebody who has nothing and needs something from anywhere to live beyond tomorrow. That's a widow. That's what the Bible means by widow. It says, first of all, somebody who is truly and actually in her situation and station in life, bereft, she has no one to turn to. That's a true widow. They should be supported. Although he says that an age requirement is put on as well. I think this should be a ballpark figure because uh, it doesn't seem uh, as if Paul really is giving an eternal age and a 59 and three quarter year old woman doesn't get support. She needs to starve until her birthday, and then we'll give her some money um, or pay for a funeral. That's not the requirement. It's not 60 on the dot. It's rather elderly women who are beyond childbearing, beyond working years. So let's read what he says. Verse 9. Let a widow be enrolled, that is, be on the support roster, if she is not less than 60 years of age. So there's an age requirement. Look at verse 11. He goes on to say, refuse to enroll younger widows. And we'll see different reasons why. So there is an age requirement. Those who are bereft without support, who are too old to be looking after themselves or working, those kinds of women are the ones who are supported by the church. But then he also makes a character requirement. A character requirement. Look at what he says. He says, a woman, 60 years of age, Having been the wife of one husband, I would add as a clarifier, at a time. She she, she may have been widowed once and then obeyed what he's going to say in verse 11 and got remarried. And then widowed again, maybe married again. And then the trifecta, she's three times widowed, but because she is so, because she's suffered three times as much in life, she doesn't get support from the church. Now, it's not about how many marriages has she had. It's about did she honor marriage? Is this woman who slept around, ended marriages because she was fornicating and adultering and was careless and held marriage in dishonor and then comes to the church when she's too old to find another sugar daddy husband and says, oh, well, church, now you have to pay me. God says, no, you're verse seven. You're dead while you live. You don't get the church's money. Church should be discriminating. So a woman who has has been a one man kind of woman having a reputation for good works. And we say, what does that mean? Then he explains. What does it mean for reputation for good works? Does that mean girl boss, CEO crazy? She's the, what does good works for a woman sound like in Paul's mind, the apostle's mind, God's mind? Let's read it. He says, this is what good works looks like. If she has brought up children, 
if she has shown hospitality, if she has washed the feet of the saints, if she has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work. In other words, you're saying, if she's going to be a spiritual mum on the church's payroll, then she's got to be a good mum. She's got to be a good woman. She's got to be somebody who in her life, uh, if her children were still alive, they would look after her because she cared for them well. But her children are either unbelievers or dead. And so she's here and she should be supported. No children, the church steps in. But if she's godless, she was not a good mother. She did not actually uh, prioritize family. She was a home wrecker or she was adulterous or she was uh, any kind, you know, thing like that. Paul says, don't give her money. That would slander God. That would blaspheme God's standards. This household does not put up in our granny flat just any old woman from the streets. In other words, sin or righteousness have consequences, even for widows. Paul's not being overly harsh. He's being real. Some young people need to learn this. The way you're living your life is going to have enormous consequences in your short, long, that short medium and long-term future. And you can't change it once you're there. If you're getting on a train, it's going to take you where it's going and trains don't do U-turns. And you get off somewhere and wherever you are is wherever your sin took you. And so you want to invest in godliness and righteousness in these young years because you don't get godly when you turn 60. You don't turn godly because you got old. You turn godly by repentance, by faith, by devotion to good works according to God's word, by surrounding yourself with good, mature, godly people and Christians who can lead you in that way. Anyway, sin has consequences and these women will get no support. But also look at what he says about age, about young widows. It's a stronger uh, command in verse 11. Discriminate, Timothy, right? He's being told, discriminate about who the church money goes towards. Refuse, Timothy, this is a stronger one. Refuse to enroll younger widows. Why do you think he has to say it that way? I think it's this. Timothy's a young guy, which means he's, he's, he's interested in women because he's a Christian. But he's responsible and he's not going to, you know, he's going to treat them as sisters. But then one of his spiritual sisters comes up and says, I've got four kids no job, not allowed to get a job because we're in the Roman Empire. Um, I, 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 I face poverty. I, I might die. Uh, I want to devote myself to Jesus. Please look at the baby on my hip and the child that's wearing rags. Please, 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 please. If I devote myself to not get married, I'll serve the church. I'll help you minister. Don't you want help with all of these crazy young ladies? I'll, I'll help them. I'll help them. Please enroll me. I won't get married. Puppy dog eyes pretty young lady, a widow, Timothy, young man Timothy is going to be tempted to say, you're less than 60, but let's make, a, let's, make a, let's make an exception. And Paul is saying, that's not going to be helpful for the church or for that woman long term. Paul's a realist. He's a good dad. He knows how to lead. And he's saying, your younger sister, if the church takes her on, is going to need a multiplicity of ministries. Do you know what she'll need? She will need a physical security detail to keep her safe because the world is dangerous. She is going to need a financial provider and a financial advisor. She is going to need a helpmate for the children, somebody to train the children because she doesn't have a dad. She is going to need theological and biblical education and dis dis like discipleship because she doesn't have a husband. She is going to require a, 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 a house to live in, somebody to help her with the chores. She is going to need all of these things. And then what are the children going to need? Goodness, they're going to need an example, a discipline, a, a financial benefit, somebody to train them into a job. They're going to need advice as they grow up, somebody to help them find a biblical partner and help them be men or biblical women. Oh, this is 25 ministries for widows and orphans already. Or, in God's design, you fold it up, roll it all up into one, and God calls that a husband. Financial provider, protector, looker after, disciple, a teacher, protect all of those things are just a husband. Paul says, that's unfitting. If they are of marriageable age, they should seek to find another husband. That's, the, that, 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 that's God's order. Because remember, church family doesn't replace nuclear family. The church as a father or husband looking after the widows does not replace marriageable age young ladies from remarrying. It's not good for them. It's not good for the church. He says in verse 16, if you support them, they'll be a burden and you will have less money to care for the old ladies who really need it. So, Paul says in verse uh, 11 and 12 and following, um, 
don't enroll those younger ladies, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for abandoning their former faith, and besides, they learn to be idlers. Here's what he's saying. If they make an oath, and this is how they did in the early church, some churches' traditions still do this today, if they are a widow, they can make an oath to join the church, the church is my husband, Jesus is my husband, I won't get married, I'll be chaste, I will not have sex, I'm devoted, and I'll help minister. And Paul says, very rarely can they uphold that. Because they're women, they, they want to get married. Men, you know, they smell, but they're, they're good, they're better than nothing, and she will fall in love with one of them eventually. And what will happen? I'll tell you what happened. The good Christian men will say, I won't cause you to break your oath of chastity. The churches back then used to have discipline for those who broke such oaths. Therefore, if you wanted to leave your oath in order to get married to a Christian man, the Christian man will say, I don't marry oath breakers, and the church will put you under discipline. Your only option then is to marry a godless man. This is what was happening. Happened then, happened in other subsequent centuries of the church, that young women could not hold up under the pressure of their singleness, of this rash vow they made, they go, I really want to get married now, and they marry just any guy who comes along, or they sleep around outside of marriage. And Paul says, by doing that, they abandon their faith, they come under the slander of the devil, they damage the reputation of the church. Timothy, young women should not become nuns and serve the church that way. Not God's order, tell them to find a husband. Or, he says, or, here's another problem. They're fine being single, and they thrive being single, and they, and, they, and they aren't swept away into men's arms. And you say, oh, well, that's good. This is a good, positive thing. Wrong. Because Paul says, if they don't fall down trapdoor A, they fall down trapdoor B. And a lot of churches call trapdoor B, which is supposed to be sin, they call this a thriving women's ministry. And it looks like this. She gets up in the morning. She has her coffee, maybe a bit of wine and a diazepam. She goes outside and she goes to uh, the shops and she gets herself a Women's Weekly, catches up on all of the gossip, um, uh, probably also takes a picture of Psalms or Proverbs of Psalms 31, puts it online so everyone can see her godliness. She goes to household number one and she prays with them and she looks after them. She collects gossip. Goes to the next household, prays with them, ministers to them, looks after their children. Mentions that their children are better behaved than household one. Anyway, I'll pray for you. Move away. Collecting gossip house to house, doing literally nothing because being visited by another woman, hear this, is not a ministry. <laughs> Having someone else in your house or going over for coffee is not a ministry, right? Emotional support, uh, discipleship, teaching, Tra you know what Titus 2 says? A lot of people say, oh, this is women's ministry. Women just visiting each other in the middle of the day. Not ministry. You know what Titus 2 says to do? Go to their house and teach the young women how to do chores, budget properly, submit to their husbands, and love their children. Yeah, not go and gossip and have coffee. Anyway, I can see that some of us are really loving this. So Paul says, even if they don't want to chase off a man, they'll just chase after gossip. You know why? Because women are built that way. Men are built to accomplish, to fight, to join teams, to, to, to set goals and do them. And when they are idle, without responsibility, they join gangs, they join stupid games online or on the streets, they are violent towards the wrong people, they fight the wrong fights, and they are sexually perverse. Women are made differently. Women are made to care, to be mothers, to love people, to be involved and, and nourishing and nurturing in the details of somebody else's life. That's mothering. So if she's idle and she's not raising children, she will still be interested in people. It's called gossip. She'll still be intimately interested in managing somebody else's life. It's just not her children, it's other people. So she'll meddle. So Paul says, and I'm reminding you, the Bible says this, and me, but not just me, it's the Bible. Paul says two problems. If a woman joins the church and makes this oath, she'll either break it and chase a man, because she's a woman, she wants to be married, or she will stay single and become idle and a gossiper and go house to house, and she will bring slander upon the church. Don't support them. Instead, he says, verse 14, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the devil no occasion for slander. Some people look at Paul and go, oh, he's such a misogynist. Look at how he speaks about women. Do you know what he commands them to do? Don't get a job. Be looked after by somebody who has to die for you, love you, 
affectionately desire you, look after you all of your day. It's marriage. Marriage is not a curse. It is not a prison. It is a gift from God. Paul says, you know who bears all of your debts if you're a widow? A new man. You know who looks after all of your broken light bulbs, your squeaky taps and the, lo- and the mowing? A new man. God's ordinary blessing for you is a husband because marriage rocks. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> marriage is great. Amen? I think, it, I think it rocks. I love marriage. I don't know about, about you guys. but uh, So, he, so this, is his, this is his injunction. Church is a family. We treat each other as such. Church is a family. We look after each other as such. Church is a family. We are careful who we give family budget to because character, godliness, and situation matters. And so I wonder where you're at. Have you heard all this and some of it being new and you go, wow, I didn't, this is interesting. I'm receiving what God the Father, my Father, has served up to the dinner table tonight. And I'm saying, I love this. This is your word. This is good and it's meat for my soul. You're a Christian. You'll say, oh man, there's some things to chew over here. I need to repent on some things. I need to fix my attitude of some things. Praise God. You're, you're a child of God. That's why you think that way. Some of you are sitting here and you thought you belonged at the table, but you, you say, I hate this meal. This is disgusting. Dad, can you, can you get fast food again? I really like the sermon where we all got told that we're amazing, that we have divine capabilities and potential, and, and I'm going to get rich this week. I prefer that church. Maybe you're realizing now you're not actually in the household of God. You're sitting here near the table, but you're not actually one of his children. You need to repent and believe in Jesus. Trust your sin to Jesus. Become a Christian. Enjoy the household of God. Some of you came in knowing that you're not members of God's family. We talked to you at the beginning. I wonder how you're feeling. Does this sound like a more glorious, more beneficial, more satisfying, more wonderful way to live? I hope you think so. But that's not ultimately why you should flee to Jesus and be saved. The main reason you need to flee to Jesus Christ and be saved is because spiritually, regardless of your gender or age or situation in life, you are a poor widow. You have debts that you cannot pay. They're sins against God. You are legally unable to even pay off those debts because the law of God sees you as impure, unholy, and condemned. You are bereft of all help and hope. No religion, no self-works can ever pay yourself out of your situation. I'm going to tell you, male or female, old or young, married or single, what you need spiritually is a husband. And the great husband's name is Jesus Christ. And he comes into the world and he lives the life you couldn't live and earns an enormous inheritance, comes over to you in your debt, in your poverty, in your bereftness and says, your old husband, the law, your old husband, sin, has abused you and left you alone. I will take you to myself. I will pay all of your sins off. I will add you to my household and you're into a new family by my father. Would you like to meet him? Jesus Christ is the great debt payer is the great provider and protector. And so I say to you, if you are not a Christian, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Trust that his death on the cross was enough. It is all that you'll ever need to pay for your sins and know for certain that when he comes back or when you die, you will go to heaven and be received by the Father because of Jesus' work for you. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you. We thank you for your word. Your word shows to us the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, that you find unsaved sinners, guilty, vile, condemned people who love our own way, who are selfish, who are, who are uh, ungodly. And you, you not only forgive us, you transform us so that we are rightly called the family of God by no merit in ourselves, but uh, uh, by your own grace and power day by day. Week by week, year by year, you make us look like our older brother. You shape us into the looking, into the character, into the likeness of our Father. Father God, I ask that you would do this again today, that you would carve off any, any old ways of thinking that your word contradicts and conflicts and make us think according to your word. Make us value what you value in women, in men, in marriage, in work, in service, in relationships, in finances. Lord God, make this very practical application settle down in our hearts so that we know how to live. Would you make us holy in these matters of marriage, of singleness, of support, of family relations? Would you make us holy in these matters so that you are not blasphemed, so that this church is not under reproach, and so that the devil has no opportunity for slander against us? We pray, Lord God, that if 
there is anybody in our midst this morning, and you know that there is, who are still not trusting in Jesus, still living in their sinful lifestyle, their selfish lifestyle, their sexualized lifestyle, would you convert them? Would you give their hearts happiness in the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you make them run to Jesus at his cross and beg for mercy and receive it? Oh God, would you give them belief in Jesus Christ and save them this day? We pray all these things in his wonderful name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.